I'm going to start my little slide presentation so you guys get to see what's going on up there. Um, but basically, I'd like to start a little bit with my history. Um, I'm a child of the early 70s, you know, sort of the, the time of the awakening of the Earth Day type movement and awareness about the Mother Earth and uh, protecting it. I grew up in rural North Carolina in a situation where um, North Carolina was experiencing 7% growth and the agricultural heritage of the state took a severe beating because of that. You get 7% growth, you get, um, it's a 10 year doubling time, so in 10 years you have twice as many restaurants, twice as many people, the roads go from single lane to double lane, you got twice as many stoplights, twice as much traffic, twice as much everything. Um, that's sort of the nature of my upbringing. I was, uh, you know, my parents and I were the pioneers of suburbia down in North Carolina. We uh, settled into a, a subdivision that was being developed, and the people there, uh, you know, we were like the third or fourth house there, and by, and by the time we left there, there was 33 houses and no more farmland. Um, so it was a pretty eye-opening experience. Um, one of the things that really it struck me in my memory about this uh, this transition that was happening in North Carolina is uh, I used to go crabbing when I was a kid. Yeah, you take a little chicken bone and dump it in the water, and the crabs would come right to it. You take a neck and get them. All right. Uh, there was a company down the down river from us called Texas Gulf. There was a fertilizer fertilizer company. And during my you know, time there, it went from like, oh, stick that chicken bone in there and grab a crab, to no crabs. This has really struck me, you know, it's, I, we talk about, you know, what's going on in the world and so forth, but it, I, and we talk about mass extinction and so forth, but at some level, I think we need to recognize that we, as a race, are also in jeopardy. And so there, there is, you know, blue crabs disappear, uh, polar bears disappear, people are next. So it's an extremely serious situation that we're up against. Um, you know, when I went to college, uh, I, I wanted to be an environmentalist, you know, save the world type thing. And um, I studied at the University of Colorado a degree called environmental conservation. And, you know, I thought I was going to get the tools to, to fix this thing. And actually what I got was a really depressing four to six years about, you know, just the problems. Overpopulation, resource depletion, climate chaos, um, pollution, you know, just the litany of bad stuff. And it was super depressing and I think the root of it is our culture. Um, right now we're in the throes of a very hyper-consumeristic, uh, individualistic, um, manner of being, of culture. So my, um, I was really fortunate to get introduced to permaculture, and so I'd like to introduce that as a concept to remedy our destructive culture. And so permaculture to me is, um, well it's a lot of things, you know, it's, it's just a word that implies a whole lot. And it's a design system that you're really looking to understand the basis of it. And the basis of it is ethics and principles. So the ethics are um, fair share, come on in, wherever you like, earth care and people care. Fair share, earth care, people care. And I really think that that is very important to consider in our current um, situation here in the Western Hemisphere. Um, in terms of fair share, this principle of design is, you know, if, if we have a cake, if you're hungry, take as much as you need. You know, take the slice that you need. If you're not hungry, pass the cake to your neighbors who need it. That's sort of the fair share mentality. Um, I think the principles, you know, we can really talk about the principles of permaculture as uh, you really look at system design. 
So you're taking different parts of a system and combining them to make the, the highest integrated use out of them, the highest utility, the highest efficiencies. So if you, the rain's falling on your property and you know gravity's going to take it downhill eventually, try to keep it up slope and retain that energy and use that energy over time. Uh, another principle is uh, the building design principle of passive solar. Um, in passive solar, you'll, in the building design principle, you'll, you use uh, greenhouse or glazing to capture the sun's energy and then over the course of the evening, later in the day, then that energy is transferred back into the building. So you're, you're, one of the principles is um, make hay while the sun shines. In other words, reserve that energy collect it, and then dispense it as you need it. Um, to me, you know, in our goals up at D Acres, and I'll, I'll get into more of you know, what D Acres actually is, um, our goals are to perpetuate. Uh, it, I think it's in, uh, you can sort of separate it from um, a lot of conventional um, thinking that goes into a lot of these conference types. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis right now on profit in agriculture. You know, profit per acre, uh, high input agriculture that yields big, right? Quick. Our emphasis up in Dorchester is to perpetuate. Like, we want to have a low input system that yields over the long term. So it's, it's, in, it's, it's a little bit different than the conventional system. Um. I, I think I need to go into a, a little bit of what the actual goals would be. You know, when you, you try to really pinpoint what you need as a civilization, I think we need um, food and water, food and clean water. Uh, shelter, uh, tools and information, community, medicine, and clothes. Clothes are very important in the Northern Hemisphere. So that's like seven things, seven really basic things that we can break down and try to obtain versus our current culture where we're really, uh, we want everything. We want, we want to amass consumer goods, we were sort of like, in my mind, uh, this cultural phenomenon that reminds me of uh, the pyramids of Egypt. You know, like, we look at them as a historical, like, anomaly. These people were pharaohs who worked, like, their whole, their empire, their whole dynasty was about the accumulation of goods that they were going to take somewhere to another world. In my mind, we're doing much the same thing with our society. You see people's jars, they're full of jet skis and, you know, toys things that they, they use on weekends or whatnot. We're doing this, we're, we're massing consumer goods that are plastic and don't really enrich our lives. So how do we get beyond this? Um, since this is an agricultural conference, I think I really try to focus on some of the land use type applications we're doing at the Acres. And perhaps at the end we'll move into more of the, the social constructs. But so let me speak to the land in New Hampshire. Um, we live on the hillside in Dorchester, New Hampshire. It was land that was granted in the 1700s by the King of England. You know, he had the privilege to, 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 to give this land to people. Um, the people in Dorchester that moved there uh, really flourished. You know, lots of people moved to town. There was a lot of resources. They were very rich forest that they cut to the ground, um, cleared all the land, and then they brought in the economic system that they had uh, set up in the British Isles, more or less sheep, sheep cultivation. And so they cleared the land, got the sheep monoculture going. Um, from 1780 to say 1850, the population of Dorchester grew to about 1,200 people. Really an explosion from zero colonists to 1,200. Then the place crashed. Uh, you have the Civil War, you have the, um, the expan well, Western expansion, free land in Ohio, really good farmland available. Um, the Civil War had bankrupted the town. You know, they had to play for the militia. 
plus all the young people left for three or four years. So who was to cut the firewood? Who was to who was to grow the crops? Um, the town. Um, when my predecessors moved to Dorchester at the farm I'm at in 1940, there was only 90 people left. It's a population collapse. And it's based on the fact that they destroyed their uh, natural resources and set up a monoculture. So economically, it was not a diverse system that had no resource base that was able to be reused. So for us, when we moved to Dorchester, our land use priority was to really recognize the, the value of the northern forest. So the northern forest is, is what makes or breaks us. We're not, we can't come up there and cut all the trees down. That is not going to serve us for the next millennium. So what we've chose to get instead is to use the forest as a model. The northern forest is super rich and abundant, but you can't eat it. There's just very limited protein. You know, there's service berry, some low bush blueberry. Um, you can make pine tea, maybe some acorn flour. So we need to figure out a edible northern forest. So in our land use pattern, what we've chosen to do is um, we do some patch cuttings, you know, some cleared areas, and then we uh, bring in animals, pigs, to create an ecological disturbance. So the pigs uh, prevent the northern forest from regenerating and increase the fertility of the land. And then we come in and we do, um, you know, we let the, the pigs really work an area and prevent, you know, like I'm saying, the, the northern trees, uh, the northern forest trees, red maple, birch, uh, well not, maybe less birch, but beech, will really regenerate from the stump. And so the pigs come in and prevent that. And also we collect um, food scraps from the town of Plymouth, from uh, colleges and restaurants and grocery stores, and that's how we're feeding these pigs. So we're electric fencing them to a certain area, and then feeding them the, the nutrients that we're gaining from the waste of our, our culture. And uh, the pigs are putting the fertility to the land. And so our next step then would be to transition. And so what we usually do is potatoes. Potatoes are our ideal crop post pigs um, for us because everyone has to cook them. No one eats potatoes raw. So you have less uh, danger of some sort of um, microbial, you know, some sort of uh, worms or bad things the pigs can leave. So everybody cooks the, the potatoes. And you also spend a lot of energy with potato cultivation, hilling them. And so we can also bring in, you know, uh, biomass to uh, hill up the potatoes on contour. So what you end up with is a transition from forest to field to crops and then right at that juncture you want to go ahead and start planting your seedlings. Um, we'll, the, the northern forest to get where we want to to have like black walnuts that are this big around and butternuts and full size apple trees and stuff that's going to take a while. Um, some of the black walnuts that we first planted when we got there are just beginning to produce. You know, you're talking 10, 15, 20 years. You're talking 75, 100 till you're getting bushels. So there needs to be a transition window from you know clearing the land to planting your orchard. And what we're doing is pigs and potatoes and other annual type crops in the understory to build the soil in that area. So it's a series of steps using people and animals and plants to get you to that edible forest garden. And that whole process could take um, 10, 15 years to get established. It's slow, but it's relatively um, low energy intensive. We don't even pull the stumps. Like all the stumps are still in the ground. We're just working around them. 
We're not using a tillage system or any tractor farming type system. So the stumps are a real advantage over the course of time. The stumps actually, um, you know, the existing root structure, there's so much biomass there. There's as much biomass as there was to the tree below ground. So that's like um, a vascular network for the, myce um, for the mycelium and the fungal action that we want to encourage. This provides pathways for nutrients, for water. And so the stumps are actually something that are good for the system. Do mushrooms on the stumps? They grow the mushroom potential is there, but the pigs would eat them, potentially. Um, it's also full sun, and they dry out. They, they do have a tendency to dry out. So there is possibility there, but it, it has to be... Um, we haven't necessarily experimented a lot. Of um, the other way that we get to food production from northern forest or from field is a lot of uh, cardboard. Excessive amounts of cardboard. It's another thing that's just readily available with the, the, um, the waste of Western Civ. Uh, it's, it's more expensive to recycle the stuff than it is to, to throw it away these days because you have to transport it to a facility. So they give it away. Um, we have a bunch of businesses down in Main Street, Plymouth, that provide us with cardboard, and we uh, take it up to the farm and we use it excessively. Um, basically, it's another uh, ecological disruption in some, some sense. It prevents uh, the understory from growing up. It retains new um, water. So it's, it's a limit, it's a mulch type product. Um, what I what I want to get to is right now talk about D Acres as an organization. Um, what it is is a construct to help people occupy the land. Um, the current system of private property, family ownership, inheritance is, you know, it really works well in some cases. You know, when you hear like six generation farms, you're like, wow, that's, that's stupendous. That's a wonderful legacy. But you also hear that divorce rate is like 50% and most kids don't necessarily want to be farmers who grow up on a farm. So it seems like sort of a rare case. So for me, I think it's really important to figure out other constructs that non-related people can occupy the land intergenerationally, right? Because what we're having in, in the United States or elsewhere in the world is you get a good farm going, um, pretty large land holding with all the infrastructure in place. The farmer gets old. He gets old, 60, 70 years old. The farm starts to decline, right? He's got, uh, the farmer, he or she has to decide how they're going to get old gracefully. You know, do they, they want to watch the place fall down around them, or do they need to sell out? And if they choose to sell out, if they don't have, you know, kids that want to take it over, the value of the land is so high that it's hard for to get local, you know, young farmers in there. Um, you know, we've created these uh, constructs to, to try to make it easier, easements and so forth, but they're very restrictive. So, we need to figure out another system of occupying the land, of managing the land, so that people can come together, can work together, perhaps they can occupy land that's under easement, or occupy land that's otherwise um, in preservation. But we need to figure out the way that they can self-organize and, and perpetuate. This whole concept of uh, <laughs> growth, it, you know, uh, just nonstop growth, limitless growth, is, um, it's not rational, it's not physically possible, and so we need to create constructs that will allow us to perpetuate on the land. Um, D Acres is a nonprofit entity. 
and first off, I, I would say that I don't think I had the answers. We have a model that is in, is is a process of the transition, right? Because right now we don't have any alternatives except for private ownership. For people to invest in a piece of property and feel comfortable and secure living out their lifetime without owning it doesn't really exist in our society. So it's 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 we got to sort of think outside the box to get where we want to get, to get land systems that the ownership is public ownership and the people working there feel like they can invest their whole, you know, their lives in that land is not what we currently have. We don't have this system in place. So, the acres, we feel like, is a step. It might, it's not the end of the game, it's not the solution, but it provides a direction, it provides a platform for experimentation, and it allows, um, it allows people to live on the land. So what we do, we have the nonprofit. It's a community service organization. We um, we have it pretty well dialed in on an annual basis. On an annual basis, we bring folks up, uh, college age folks, people interested in farming, uh, internationals, and we run like um, how do I describe it? It's like um, it's sort of campy. So it has a little bit of camp feel to it. It also has a, lot, a little bit of school feel to it. Um, and it has a lot of community feel to it. And people come, um, mostly transitional people. That's, that's what we're really good at right now, is you want to come for six weeks, six months, and learn about farming, sign up. Let's do it. So during the summertime, we'll have 12 to 15 people Working on site, uh, you got three to four staff, and then a transitional crew. And we're super good at this. Uh, I don't know how really how we got there, but we can do it. Like it's a it's a lot of labor, unskilled labor, that ends up very um, very successful because people get to see seed to seed, and they get to see seed to plate. Right there, it's it's hands on and very practical. Um, and we can maintain ourselves because we have a inexpensive source of labor. So how we make money is um, a diverse stream and it's not from selling produce. We, we don't want to sell produce. I don't believe that it's, you get a fair value for it on the market, um, like potatoes in Maine, you get potatoes for five cents a pound. Uh, it's not even worth really going and picking them up off the ground for five cents a pound. Um, where we look to make revenue from the products we make, uh, grow, is value adding. So the idea is to take that potato out of the ground and put it on somebody's plate and charge them considerably more money than you would uh, for uh, wholesale. So we actually have um, a semi restaurant as well as um, we have food events. So the way to um, make money in our system is to value add and to retain the nutrient cycle on site. So to me, you know, farmers that are really getting into this game where they're, they're putting in a lot of inputs, a lot of compost, a lot of nutrients, and then shipping their produce around the state, it's an endless cycle, right? You gotta keep bringing in those nutrients. For me, the key that we found is that the, um, you can bring the, uh, the nutrients on site, you know, keep adding nutrients on site, but then figure out ways to retain your nutrients. Hue manure is a great example of that. So we don't have any flush toilets on the property. So everybody that comes there, 
leaves their poop and their pee so we can use it. And we're feeding them food on site, our organic food is going right back into that system. So it's never leaving the site. It's not an extractive type farming. It's a, you're, you're inputting, constantly building the system. So how else do we make money in this system? Um, we do workshops and classes. We sell farm products on occasion. But lots is this value adding. We have a wood shop on site. So we do furniture, craft items. We also um, will do overnight accommodations. We have <coughs> campers and we have um, rooms that we rent out. So all of this more or less um, builds a farm entity that is different than your typical market farm. The farm entity at D Acres, you know, we do community service, so we'll be doing um, outreach in the community. So people will go in and do after school programs, farm after school programs. We've developed a, a local farm guide. We've done um, uh, Local Foods Plymouth, which is an online farmer's market. So you, you have this farm where you're doing community outreach. The farm is also an attraction. So we have like the food events. So every weekend there's an event. There's a breakfast on the first Sunday of the month. On the second Friday there's pizza and movie night. On the last Friday there's potluck and open mic. Last Saturday, volunteer day. It's an attraction for the community. There's also classes, workshops, lots of kids related stuff. We actually listed somewhere there's a radio station that listed us as the top winning the top ten of attractions in the state. If you've been to New Hampshire you know there's not much. So it really <laughs> you know there's like a, a Clark's trade post where they have bears and cages and stuff and there's a water park. But we're like number nine or something. Like <laughs> but it really gets at what we're trying to do is to make the farm a venue where people go for other activities than to just buy a tomato. We have a playground, for heaven's sakes. I, when I started farming, I never thought, oh, a playground, you need a playground. But, but it's great. It really works well for this. Um, if the adults are in a class, uh, taking a class, you know, a two hour class on compost, and their kids can go play at the playground. Everybody has fun, it's a great day. Um, we also have recreational trails. You know, our property um, is extensive. There's 200 acres that, um, on the property, and most of it's woodlands. And most of it we never intend to farm or to um, do any serious uh, development to. So how do we best utilize that area? Of course, it's, you know, it's, it's cleaning the water for us and cleaning the air, but it also provides a tremendous opportunity for recreation. So it is really about trying to figure out how to change the face of agriculture from this, the current conventional model where it's sort of a food production provides profit and revenue to a place that provides a livelihood. And I think it really gets back into this overall cultural shift that we need to, to be cognizant of and to, to push ourselves in that direction. Um, the extractive, uh, exploitive, hyper-consumerist model that's really based on the individual, we need to figure out a way to, to go the different direction. And once again, I don't really have um, a firm sense of what that answer is. I don't think I'm necessarily um, a socialist or a communist or anything of that nature. I don't really think that central planning would be the answer to this. But it is a different model of land tenancy, of localization, of you know really trying to grow the roots and build the soil. And it is an enduring process that is very much different than the conventional model of, you know, 
2016, we're going to plant this many carrots and we're going to sell this many carrots. You know, that sort of thing. We, we have to figure out um, bridges and transitionals to evolve and adapt. And I really feel like, um, okay, I'm not saying this is the answer, but the direction that we need to go. Um, as far as the presentation today, I'm really open to discussion as, as a, uh, a method of moving this, this, pre, this forward for the next hour. Um, I have these slides. We could definitely go through them on a more one, one, on, uh, one, one side from what I could talk. We could do that. I hate that myself. I'm just not sold on it. Um, I remember being in high school and we had these movies where they would hit the tape and you would forward the, 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 the slide every, you know, ding! And it's just, I can't do it. I can't do it. I saw a presentation from another permaculture guy a couple weeks ago and it was the same one he gave three years ago. You know, he's got the same PowerPoint, he says the same things. And it's just like, ugh. I, I don't want to sit through it. I don't want to put myself through it. I don't want to put you through it. But that being said, where can we go from here? D Acres is uh, an entity that I've been working with for about 20 years. And the concept when I came there was very limited. Like, I thought we were going to be market gardeners. I come from the West Coast where we're, we're on, um, in the San Juan Islands where we're selling greens for 20 bucks a pound. I thought we were going to move to New Hampshire and do the same thing. But I had made the same mistake the original colonists had made. I had tried to transfer an economic system from one location to another location. It was totally different. The soil is different. The, the growing season is different. Your base of consumers was completely different. So nobody in Dorchester wants salad greens for 20 bucks a pound. The growing season is three months instead of 12 months. You're not going to be able to live doing this. Um, you have to more or less look at your, your land base, the economic surrounding area, and your natural resources and develop a system that's individual for your farm entity. Also, I have to consider the people that are involved. Like, I particularly have an interest in woodworking. So it's real easy for me to say, hey, yeah, look at all the wood. Wow, this is great. Look at all the resources. This is build a wood shop. I can do this for the rest of my life. But if you're not into woodworking, I don't want to think about doing something else somewhere in the flats or something. Um, the one thing I would consider as well, you know, we're in the mountains. We have good water source, good clean water. Um, the soil is just horrific. Like sand, it's glacial till. There's nothing left there. We have to, you know, the original, the glaciation period stripped the Appalachians and it all went downhill. And then the people that moved up there in the 1800s, they weren't kind and gentle to the um, They were in survival mode. And so the, the soil is just horrible. Um, so we're also using the northern forest. We have a chipper, and we do a lot of chipping. We do, do a lot of hugel piles, um, just trying to sequester the carbon, sequester the nutrients, um, transform them into food. You know, we, we have to actually cut down a pine tree and chip it, and then turn it into mulch, compost to get it in the soil to grow food, grow tomatoes. Because the pine tree, like I said, you get a little tea off it, but it's not going to supply your caloric intake that you need. So you have to transform it, you have to transition, you have to evolve it, you have to take it from one state into this other state. And keep that cycle going. When I speak of human manure, it's, it, it is that. It is so much that, um, that people would, would flush away the nutrients and forget about them is not rational. Like we need to get, get over that fecal phobia and, and get, it, get into this scientific approach because it is just a big waste. Um, the one concept though, you know, when I talk about being in the mountains and seeking the forest as a model, and as our source of fertility to a degree, if we were anywhere close to the seacoast, the ocean 
would be that source. You know, the, um, the fertility that could be derived from that immense photosynthetic, you know, it's just a, um, it creates nutrients. The, the seaweed, I was just, we'll be pulling massive amounts of seaweed and composting seaweed to build soil. Just a completely different system based on your geography and your location. Got a question? Yeah, I was going to ask if you could talk about some of the other specific systems you use. Like you mentioned the pigs and then moving the potatoes from there. You talked a little bit about the humanoir. Any other specific? Um, well, we do. Um, we talk about the community building as a specific system. Um, when we first moved to Dorchester, we, I was living in my truck, and uh, the rest of the crew sort of moved into a barn. Yeah? So we used a barn as a community building. And when we moved into the barn, we discovered <laughs> it's got limitations. Um, it's not sanitary, and it's not very accessible. You know, so I had an aunt, 89-year-old aunt, that would try to host for dinner, you know, try to bring her over and show her what we were doing. And she could hardly make her way into the building. You know, it's just very, lots of steps, lots of uneven floor, really tough situation for her to negotiate. Um, living in the barn, we had like a, a well, you know, a hand-dug well we were getting water off of, uh, filtering the water. We were washing our dishes. We would heat up water on the wood stove and then um, had a ketchup bottle that we would rinse our dishes with. Fill up the ketchup bottle with, with warm water and rinse. Like this is rudimentary. It was it was functional and practical in some senses, but there was no way we could invite the community at large and say, I wanna live like this. You know, they're just not they're not gonna buy it. So the the first really permaculture project that we undertook was um, a design for a community building that would integrate what we needed. And so the community building has um, multifunction. We call it the multiplex in the building. And it has um, wood shop and commercial kitchen on the first floor. The, that's the heart of our farm. Commercial kitchen it enables us to value add. It enables us to value add in many different ways. You know, not only can you make pickles that then you can eat in the winter, you can make pickles that then you can sell. You can make pickles that then your guests can come and eat. So with many different streams of income, many different opportunities it opens up for you, plus it is the absolute heart of any household. You know, where the food is produced is where it's at. That's where you're spending the most time. Um, it's not your master bedroom. I mean, your, your waking hours aren't spent in your master bedroom. So the commercial kitchen is just the heart of the farm. The wood shop is the real part of the, the working part of the farm. Because it, you know, day to day, there's so many needs on the farm. You know, you need a screwdriver for this, you need a, a, a hinge, you need, a you know, whatever you need. I'm in and out of there constantly, every day. And it also supplies the value adding component. We can take the, the wood products that, from the forest and make crafts. I can't tell you how many freaking spoons I've made to keep this place in business. <laughs> like ridiculous amounts of handmade thousands. But they sell really well and they cost me nothing. It, no, no investment other than the tools and my time. So it's a really lucrative return for a piece of firewood. <laughs> Really, it, the, the wood has been so plentiful and up there, but we get orders from, and this is something I don't necessarily like, orders from all over the country. And um, we also have, are members of a local art co-op. But so the wood working shop and the commercial kitchen provide the economic basis, the social basis. It's really just the heart of the farm. Um, in our basement of that building, we also have root cellar. And that is also just a crucial component that we would not be able to uh, live at this level of subsistence without a root cellar. The root cellar is a really great example of um, infrastructure that once it's in place, 
You don't have to plug that sucker in. You don't have to replace it. It's solid state. Like a refrigerator or freezer, they're going to wear out, right? They cost money. They, they get energy every time it's plugged in. For us, with a root cellar, this time of year, from November to April, we don't need a refrigerator. It's not even necessary. You just put everything in the root cellar, stick it in coolers. Um, our next step is what we'd like to do is go ahead and build an ice house. So then we could bring the ice into the root cellar and, and have the, the storage year round. So, you know, 10 months out of the year. Um, within that system is just a recognition of the importance of the various types of food preservation. Um, for us, just trying to get away from the freezer. You know, the freezer is is another pretty much broken uh, consumerist product. You know, it's convenient. For some reason it's convenient. For, for farmers in California to flash freeze broccoli, stick it in a, a, a tractor trailer, ship it to New England where it's freezing outdoors, put it in a grocery store where it sits in the, case, the freezer case that people open the, the doors all day, and then take it home to their individual freezer Well, it's still freezing outdoors. And then, you know, it sits in there for six months, it gets freezer burning, and they end up chucking it or, you know, nobody wants to eat. But the point of it is, really, the broccoli that goes into that freezer is substandard when it comes out, right? Has anyone ever eaten anything that's been frozen that tasted as good as it was fresh? There's one exception, just so you know. The exception is ice cream. <laughs> but everything else is worse, right? There's mushy, the, the texture, the nutrient quality, everything has been diminished. It's a broken product. It doesn't work. Um, but yeah, we all have one. We all rely on it. We all open it up and stare in it. Um, but we just have to take ourselves back. 50 years ago, the thing didn't exist. 75 years ago thing didn't even exist. It wasn't a part of our culture. We did not rely on it as we do now. So we had to think of all the different ways, drying, um, canning, fermenting, um, and all the charcuterie, all the, uh, you know, for the uh, animal products, all the different ways that you can preserve food without freezing it. And I would say on that note, the proof is in the flavor. Like if you can do it right, if you can do prosciutto right, it is awesome. Mm -hmm. And you stick it in your mouth and people are like, whoa, I, ooh, yeah. Like it changes, it can open your, it can change your mind. And that's really, at some level, what we're trying to do at the acres is provide the flavor on people's plates. And I feel like that's sort of the proof. Like that's, that's how you can really, I, you know, you can use all this uh, rationale and trying to talk people through it. You know, we need to get away from this convenience culture and so forth. But if you can actually provide them something that tastes better, that makes them feel better, that is where it's at. That's how we can make this leap, this cultural transformation. Because so many people feel like shit all day. Their livelihoods and their food the lack of exercise is killing them. So we need to figure out a way to get them outdoors, get them engaged, get them connected with one another, and get them to put that, put that nutrition into their mouths. And this type of community outreach pro project is one of those tools, is a, meet, is, is, a, is a transitional place where we can bring youth, we can bring adults, we can do a permaculture design course, we can do composting for kids. Um, this is the type of center that we can do all of that at. It doesn't have to be a nature center. It doesn't have to be a science center. It can be a farm. It's really cool like that. Oh boy, now we got questions. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. I just wondered, so if you've been doing this for, you personally have been doing it for 20 years, um, now you have enough time for a generation to go through. There must be some kids who are out. So I'm just curious to know. Well, we're not big breeders. <laughs> there are kids in your person. You know what I mean. I'm just wondering whether it's whether it's new people or people who grew up there. I'm just wondering if 
if one of the goals was to um, you know, perpetuate, perpetuate, is it happening? Or do you see it happening? Or I think the shakers actually. I, Shakers died out, yes, yeah, definitely. And, the <laughs> like, <laughs> and the Shakers are a great lesson. Um, definitely had learned a lot from them when we first came up. There's a great Shaker history in, in this region, Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And so definitely took that to heart, that understanding. Um, where we are going right now, there are some youth that live on the farm. Um, they are well invested in the animals and the lifestyle. Uh, the little boy is about 10 years old, is a real proficient blacksmith. I mean, it's crazy. Like, I'm 10 years old, I wasn't playing on fours. A um, uh, little girl, you know, she takes care of the animals. She takes care of her, her horse. Um, she's, she's, they, they know how, they know farm. It's really cool. The little boy could drive a tractor. Crazy. I was like, uh, um, uh, They grew up on a, a farm down the way and then have moved up with us. Um, we don't have a tractor, so. Excuse me, but could you just basically describe what your community on the farm is? What is the situation? You said you wanted to, part of the idea is to ride an alternative to traditional private ownership and inheritance. So what is your system? How does it work? Who are you? Okay, so the nonprofit is a, is a standard structure for uh, organizations. It's a standard business structure. So the nonprofit is the organizational entity. So that's who uh, pays bills, um, provides, you know, pays bills for food, pays bills for taxes, rent, does the uh, overhead. The internal community has been transitory. Over the course of 20 years, um, we started out, it was myself and my sister and three other people. And that we had met along our travels, farming and so forth. And we came with the original intention of helping my aunt die. She was 89, she lost her driver's license. She was gonna get sent to a home. So that was, that was the end game. That was the end game for this farm. Um, we came in, we, uh, we learned a lot from Edith, Aunt D. She's the D in the AP actress. And so Aunt D, uh, we inherited the farm from Aunt D. She, her, she, her daughter had predeceased her. Her husband had predeceased. Um, the other people with me at that time weren't interested in staying very long. They were interested in starting something, you know, sort of getting it going. Um, I stuck it out <coughs> with my aunt, uh, and because I firmly believe that you need to stick it out. I think I believe in roots. I believe in roots. So, um, over the course of the 20 years, the longest anyone has ever stayed is seven years. Two people have stayed for seven years besides myself. Um, <coughs> fortunately, the woman who, she left two years ago, she, she'd stayed seven years as well. She still lives in the area and still works with us quite extensively. But for the most part, it has been a transitory. Like, I would say, oh, well over 200 people. Have, have come through. You know, typically over the course of the year, it's 20 to 30. This past year, it was 16 people. Um, it is, once again, we are real good at doing something on an annual basis. Where we're transitioning right now, we need housing and we need the structure. We, we have not figured out the economic structure to supply equity and security to people. Currently, we have this nonprofit structure, and there are limitations to the nonprofit structure. I'll try to explain. Board of directors. So the board of directors is what really owns the nonprofit. It's a community-owned organization, a publicly-owned organization. So the board of directors is not supposed to be directly tied to the people living there. There's not supposed to be that conflict of interest so there's that separation there that exists. <clears throat> the chair of the board of directors was a resident in 2001. You know, 15 years ago, he was a college kid. 
he learned on the farm some basic carpentry and gardening thing, and now he's a local timber farmer. So he's the chair. He lives right down the road. <coughs> he helped me with a fire door the other day. You know, we, we're, we're, we're working together on a regular basis, but he doesn't live there. But he does believe in the process. Like his, his main venture turned into um, creating a charter school, a nature-based charter school in the area. And now we work with them extensively for their community gardens and their after school, school programs. Um, but it is, it, it's a project for that 200 acres, but it's also a project for the Baker River Valley. And so I'd say I know of at least 10 people and several couples that moved to D Acres and then settled in the valley. Like moved from California to D Acres, stayed at D Acres for six months and then decided they were going to live in the valley. Could, is the reason that people don't stay longer, is it because they have an urge to own their own property privately or is it just that the community is a little too, I don't know? Well, there, there is definitely that, I, I've heard that sentiment. Private ownership is something we have been indoctrinated. You know, there's there's a couple hundred years of, of really Adam Smith type thinking there, and the, the Cartesian thinking that really uh, has um, convinced many people that private ownership is the, the key to happiness and livelihood. So it, it, that that has been a factor, I think. Um, It, it complex factors could, could, could convince people to come as well as to to depart. Um, there was a woman who worked with us for this past year as a organizational administrator. She had come from a very corporate type existence. She'd been in advertising, and she needed a break. Um, some level, she I think she considered living there for long term, but she is concerned about getting old. She's thinking, really, where's the security in this? You know, this is a nonprofit, a little tenuous. You know, we got to make, we barely make enough money every year to survive. You know, how, how do you make a hundred thousand dollars a year in Dorchester, New Hampshire? Um, it is tough in those returns, and I think at some level she was concerned about her security. So after a year, she went back into the private sector. Um, she had a great time. She really gave a lot to the place. She worked her ass off, but she she was concerned that maybe this this was not the, the right. You know, she's forty odd. Um, so what I need to do and what the organization needs to do is to figure out how to meet those needs. And I would say the needs are equity and decision making and security for tenure. If you have the equity in decision making, then you, you know you, you can be a part of the budget, you can be part of the financial decisions, you can be a part of the personnel decisions, who else you live with, and so forth. Um, the security is another. You know, how do you get a lifelong lease? How do you develop a relationship with uh, the ownership entity, whether it's a, a land trust or a board of directors? That they'd say, okay, yeah, you you've been here quite some time. You want to stay? All right, it's a deal. We're not there yet. We don't have this structure yet. I hope in ten years I can come back and tell you we've gotten there. But all we've gotten to is this operating type entity. We we're, we're real good at growing food, eating food, providing food. Making that, you know, we've made at least hundred thousand dollars for the last ten years, and it there's nothing up there, and no other business in town. There's three hundred people in Dorchester. There's no stoplights. There's no, there's no nothing. No business. So there's no other farms in town. Um, it's been a coup in that regard. <laughs> Who's next? You. Yes. Yes, you. Um. Do you think that moving away from private land ownership is a method for dismantling racial disparity? I do in some sense. Yes, I do. Um, often we get in these permaculture discussions and there is a really, there's the emphasis to recognize the First Nations 
you know? And to real, I, I feel very strongly about that recognition. My recognition I would put towards that is to eliminate this, uh, the accumulation of private assets by individuals. You know, it's one thing you, if you, private property, you have as much as you need. But when this private property gets into the thing where, you know, the neighbor's got 30,000 acres and other people have nothing, that's, that's not fair. That's not equitable for our, for humanity. So, yeah, I think in terms of recognizing the First Nations, we need to recognize the system. The, the ownership in the terms that we have today did not exist. These deeds, these legalese, and it... In, in some sense, really, it's not rational. It's another one of these broken systems. You know, you have fracking or something of that nature where people can drill holes in the ground and pollute their neighbor's water. Or we have, um, you know, the whole business with climate change, how, how corporations can pollute the atmosphere. And we all have, we all drink, you know, breathe the air and drink the water. So the system's already broke. Private properties, you know, it's a broken system. It's allowing individuals and corporations to pollute the whole thing. Well, that doesn't make sense. Um, but you could have private property somewhere and create a factory that pollutes the air. Or like Texas Gulf had a factory along the water at the Tar River, destroyed the whole waterway. That's not equitable, that's not fair, that's not just. So we need to get there, you have justice. Okay, yeah. Uh, you said you had a lot of kids programs on your farm. Yeah. Are there any that uh, connect with kids better than other? Any topics that connect with kids better than other topics? I like the food too. I like cooking. Cooking with kids. I think it's real strong. And doing the gardening, the actual gardening act activities is real strong. Just to get, get sensory stuff, feeling, um, feels, tastes, smells. I think that's really, really um, powerful, powerful, powerful experiences for kids. Um, teamwork, when we can incorporate the teamwork. Um, from my experience, as far as curriculum building, it is really age and experience. You, you gotta, you gotta have your six through eight, your eight through ten. You, you can't turn it into a six through twelve. It, it, it gets more difficult. Um, having per parents involved in these also seems to help, you know. Uh, you know, I've heard instructors and, and people say both ways, you know, if we get the parents out of here, then the kids start to behave better. But I think the parents gain, gain a lot from the, the from working with their kids in, the, in that environment and us, you know, sort of saying, all right, well, just go ahead and get down in there. Like, the parents haven't actually get, gotten down in there yet either. So when they do it, then... They, they feel, oh, we can go home and do this. So that seems to work pretty well. Um, I like cooking. I think they're cooking, really. Because then they have something to show for it, too. It's like, and then you get the reward. So I, I like the cooking. Um, it's not good. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you mentioned that you need to um, add housing to your infrastructure. And I wonder if you would talk about what the need is and how you envision uh, providing for that need. Um, and the other one has to do with succession of the organization, not in the sense of inheritance, but in the sense of perpetuation. Because um, there are a couple of you who've been there throughout, I think you said. Um, just you. So, okay, some people have come and gone and come back again, as well as like the, the woman who's living there now with her kids, she's been involved with the organization for over 10 years. So I was thinking about in terms of how an organization <coughs> maintains itself and its processes when people keep coming and going. That's my question about succession. Because any one of us can come or go at any time. Okay. So, uh, I got an answer for What was the first question again? Housing. Housing. 
Okay, so then these ties to zoning. So I'll ask the second question first. Is endless meetings. Endless. Good Lord. I spent so much time in meetings. But I've seen very you know unproductive meetings in all different places as well. Um, what I feel, feel the answer to having a productive meeting is, is everybody has to be trained to the roles. You know, if you're going to be a facilitator, you need to know how to facilitate this meeting. If you're going to be note taker, that sort of thing. Um, if you're in charge of the vibes or whatever, you know, step up when the vibes get bad. Um, but the, the real manner of having success with these meetings is the note taking and the agenda driven. So, you know, we make a bunch of decisions one week, come back the next week, see what happened with those decisions. Versus, oh, let's start talking about that problem again. You know what I mean? So, in our notes, in our note taking, it's what the agenda was, what the discussion was, what the action plan is. And so next week, we just, what, what happened? Did we do it or not? And if we didn't, we're going, you know, so it's not reinventing the wheel. It's making progress. We're traction. We're going. And so if, if you have that format on a week to week, we typically, when we get up to 12 to 15 people, we usually have two meetings. We have like a staff or interested parties meeting and then an overall group meeting. And so one will be more dealing with minutia or organizational details or long-term planning. The next one will be dealing with you know that just that next week, but don't skip a week. We don't because we we just start chasing our tails and you know you you lose the focus, you lose the edge. Um, uh, that being said, too, it is a long work week we're putting in. I'm typically working 80 hours in the winter, 120 in the summer, so that's just sort of gives you a time commitment. The, um, I don't have to commute, and I eat the best food in the world. I'm wealthy. Um, zoning and housing. This is huge. This is really huge. Dorchester doesn't necessarily have zoning. Um, it's <laughs> supposed to be agricultural community, agricultural and residential. But when we got there and started doing all this shivas, you know, all this activity and stuff, we had some problems with the local um, planning board. Because in essence, what they argued was, was we had transcended a farm. We had become a manufacturing facility. We had become a restaurant. We had become a hotel. We had become a school. Which is, we, we, we do a lot of those functions from, from a farm. And so uh, they came after us, and there is a, a, a big dispute right now going on in the state of New Hampshire about agritourism. Sort of, it's been going on, going on, going on. Um, at some point in time, uh, the legislature gave us a little leeway, and the local town, uh, we're no longer in like a lawsuit or anything like that. But that being said, zoning is a huge element of our plans to become more of a perpetuation, and more of a long-term place for people to live. Because, once again, it's one of these tools that was designed to sort of help stop development or rampant development, zoning. And so they want you to have two and a half acres for, for every dwelling. So that they, they want a construct that creates suburbia, right? So everybody has their two and a half acres, and they have their setback and everything. And what we want to do is more like uh, multifamily housing or uh, pod housing, diff different type models. Um, trying to fit, think where I want to go with this discussion. Because there's, to accomplish this, uh, in the past, because of the, the methods that we have in the legalese, one of the basic constructs of a community, so to speak, has been to use um, the format of a condominium association. Okay, this is sort of a leap. Uh, um, typically, 
to figure out a way that individuals can own their house, and but we can collectively contribute towards like the plowing or the you know the other maintenance costs. This is how people form. It's a condominium association. There's not other legalese. There's not like a community's zoning. It's, it's oh, well, we'll follow this format of the condominium association. It's sort of an established protocol to share ownership to the group. Because, you know, your condominium association, you all share the clubhouse and you all go, go play tennis or whatnot. You can use the laundry room together or whatnot. You know what I mean? And you all pitch in for that, but you, you own your condo and you can trade your condo. Yeah. So um, what we need is uh, eventually we need to develop a format that people can either you know trade in their equity, if they feel like leaving, their security, um, that allows for that construct. What we're heading as far as and we spent uh, the last maybe four years really trying to figure out what we wanted to, to do is I think where we're heading is to build like a pod situation where you have um, a central building that had um, dining and bath facilities in it. And then auxiliary buildings, maybe some being duplexes, that just have bedroom and, and bath. And that circumvents zoning in our town because to subdivide as a dwelling, the dwelling has three features, as sleeping, sanitation, and cooking. So if you only put two features in a building, you don't have that subdivision necessity. So we're trying to circumvent the zoning so we don't have to subdivide. Once again, the subdivision, once we get into subdivision, the property is legally subdivided. There's tax implications for that. There's limitations on your land, like you've got to have enough frontage to, to subdivide. And once that subdivision process starts, it's very difficult to stop it. You know, this has been the destruction of these large land holdings is through subdivision. Um, once they get parceled off, then you know, that guy might have been, you know, all for the community, all for, but he, his kid, his kid likes dirt bikes and rock and roll and wants to set up a motocross course, you know, so, uh, or he sells it to, you know, who knows. So the subdivision is a threat, potentially, and we're, we're just really cognizant of that, trying to maintain the, the land as much infrastructure and as much Square footage as we can, in some sense. Yes, sir. Isn't that kind of a point of the concept of uh, the problem is always a part of the solution? So zoning or subdividing is. That's a cliche that <laughs> problem is a solution. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, you know, in some situations like this, you know, septic system, the problem is a solution. The problem, you know, to fix the septic system, you probably got to dig it up and repurpose it. You know what I mean? So in this case, I think like zoning and stuff has its purpose, but it needs to be dug up and, and re-examined. Because the zoning that was originally intention was to encourage suburbia. Like 30 years ago, they were like, let's turn Dorchester into a bedroom community. We don't want a bunch of people, multi-families living on two acres. This is gonna turn it into a, you know, Sanford and Son, some sort of trash heap. What we need is people to come in here, buy at least two acres, build a proper house, set it back, make it look nice, and then we'll have development. You know, they wanted a bedroom community in Dorchester. What I want is people occupying the land, working the land. And it's a different model than the intention. So we need to dig it up, revamp it, and bury it again. There's, there's, Sort of my concept, but so um, I, don't, I don't have a good analogy for the problem with the solution. I just want to question follow up. Um, is there a certain number of people within an acreage that they go from maybe being regenerative to consuming again? So you're trying to build a community where they're regenerative and then you hit a cap and it starts to become. I think so. I think so. 
Um, there is a population density, you know, depending on the land and the resource base. Um, I think where we've come to a conclusion is uh, the 200 acres, we probably wouldn't ever exceed over 30 people. So you'd have uh, people of my age sort of in, in the, the, you know, the everyday workforce, plus you have kids, plus you have seniors, and not all that 30 total. Um, and yeah, I, I think there is probably a limit with the land base, for sure. I mean, there's a limit in the firewood, there's a limit in the food production. Um, how, how do we translocate this idea to, to a larger, you know, how, do, how does D acres and D acres uh, type models, how do they consolidate and how do we form this patchwork that is a local government? Is a process. We're, we're really fortunate in Dorchester and in New Hampshire is we still have town meetings. And so that's where we've been getting a lot of this work done. Um, like when I moved to town, my aunt was, you know, aging but still sort of an insider, so to speak. You know, sort of, she'd been there for 40 or 50 years. So she, uh, my uncle had been a selectman, so the moderator. So they'd been part of the town government. When I came there, I was sort of outsider, but now I'm the moderator. Uh, my dad was, was the chair of the planning board. Uh, we've uh, become a part of the government. We, in essence, uh, have a lot of local control. I mean, I'm the person that people hand their ballot to and I stick it in the box. I say, hey, thanks for voting. Have a great day. I won more votes than anybody in the whole town last election. It's amazing. What a transition. I'd say that's a large part of just putting the roots in. Just standing firm, putting the roots in, um, being very consistent to the broader community in your mission, in your ethics, and in, in what you provide, what you stand for. Consistency. Because there was a lot of concern when we first moved to town. Hippies having lots of kids. Um, that people were worried about this. Um, so uh, you, you sort of have to um, prove, and it takes time uh, to get yourself into the community. Here. You were next, I believe, sir. Can you talk more a little bit uh, about the food production? And how much do you have under production? How much land you have under production? What's your balance of Absolutely. annual versus perennial crops, that kind of thing? That would be great. Thank you for pointing me in that direction. The um, the annual production when we first started was very small. Like we brought a, a half bushel basket of garlic with us, and that's that's what we started with in terms of food self sufficiency and so forth. Right now we're probably you know we're over sixty percent in the summertime, 80, 85 percent self sufficient, and that's as well as feeding you know thousands of people that come through for these food events. Um, what we've done is we have about probably two, two and a half acres of annual production, and it's just every year getting it bigger, trying not to take any steps back, maintaining what we got, and pushing it out. And then from the inside, pushing the forest garden out. So the places that we were doing annuals 15 years ago are now established forest garden. Um, I, say it's probably about two and a half acres of annuals and two and a half acres of forest garden right now. So within the, the forest garden, it's every year buying 500 bucks a nursery start from Fedco or some such. And just planting another 10 apple trees, another, well, what do we put on the list? Of Walnuts, butternuts, getting them in the ground. Every year, mm, figuring out a way to stuff more perennial fruit production food and fruit production into the matrix. Um, the annuals, on the annual side, you know, lots of potatoes and carrots. You know, uh, potatoes really work well with school groups. Get them out there hilling your potatoes, planting your potatoes. It's a great activity for large numbers of people. Um, uh, that's who generally does our potatoes, the school groups. Um, but the potatoes are the basis of our food system. They're going into you know, the breakfast, the first Sunday breakfast, we do 50 pounds of potatoes at least every breakfast. So it's just, that's the backbone. Um, pigs, 
as far as the animals, doing uh, pigs consistently. Uh, just have this tremendous source of food waste from Plymouth State University, from the Hannaford's Group supermarket, and the whole, all of Main Street, Plymouth. So generally picking up, I would estimate at least two tons of food a week. And that goes straight to the pigs. We've raised up to 60 pigs on site. That was way too much. Right now we're raising, uh, we have 12. Oops. Um, we also do beef and chicken, but not so much uh, beef. The land base isn't really there for it. We don't have enough pasture. We just got a horse too, so let's not get into that. The, um, I think for me, the food model has really come a long way from that first, you know, just having a half bushel of garlic to right now, this sort of full season, four season diet. And it really has been uh, an acceptance of our climate and situation. Like, I'm not eating a lot of greens this time of year. We have some microgreens growing and stuff. But in general, it's like potatoes, winter squash, sausage, carrots during the winter. I eat a lot of that. And then in the summer, just going right back into the summer veggies, like can't eat enough peas, can't eat enough zooks, can't, you know, just stuffing salad and just and, and sort of going for that reality and making that really um, the way to do it. You know, the pizza night is a great example of how we're trying to showcase that. So in the summer, pizza night is loaded with greens and fresh veggies and stuff like that. Whereas the, in the winter time, it's sausage and winter squash that are making up the majority of the top potatoes, top carrots, that sort of toppings. So we're trying to emulate that seasonal diet, and I think that's getting us a lot closer to the food security uh, or food security or you know, the resilience model that we really want is the seasonal diet, and that plays into you know the utilization of the root cellar and all the sort of the preservation calendar, preservation and um, culinary delights that come from the calendar. But it definitely is a progression through the seasons. Is that helpful? Yeah, it is. Do you, you have like a source of inspiration for the models that you apply to your annual, annual agriculture? Like in terms of the systems that you use, like no-till or till or... Oh, it's, the, it's not no-till. We don't have a tractor or a rototiller. Um, it, it's like that fork type. I, I mean, I draw a lot of inspiration from readings, you know, like John Jeevens was really influential. Um, it's a biointensive agricultural system. I don't know if you guys are familiar. It's been a while since he was a popular author, but a uh, very biointensive perspective. Um, I mean, Joel Salatin is as far as rotation and using the animals to to rotate around the property, using the grass-fed mentality has been really a powerful influence. Um, there's a book called uh, Designing and Maintaining an Edible Landscape that uh, was really influential in terms of the progression of the forest garden, um, establishing a system where you know you get a seedling in the ground that's about as big as your pinky, you paid 30 bucks for, and just trying to nurture that sucker until you know six years later when it finally gives you an apple. You know, it's uh, um, designing and maintaining the edible landscape is really influential in that. It is uh, it's sort of a precursor to uh, edible forest gardens for Dave Jackie. But, um, Designing and maintaining has all these schematics in it of like how to set up a mulch ring and lots of schematics on like root structure. Is it Robert Cork is the guy who wrote the book. He also wrote a book called Roots Demystified, which is really influential as well. Can you spell his last name? K O U R I K. He also wrote a book on um, irrigation, so I would recommend. Um, but designing and maintaining an edible landscape is, is just a seminal work. Do you manage that all by yourself? Like, do you oversee the agricultural production yourself in addition to all the other stuff you're dealing with? But I can. Um, it, it sort of has depended. You know, we, we evolve. 
we totally evolved. So um, lots of times uh, in the past, I've been more involved with construction and organizational type stuff, forestry type things. This past season, I got to be garden manager for the first time. I was really psyched. Um, it's really what I want to do more than anything is just play in the dirt and then grow stuff. But um, I haven't had that opportunity yet, just how things work. And my, my, um, my, my capacity as a builder is, is pretty strong, so I'm useful in that regard. Um, so your structure kind of has like job descriptions in the build holes. I know it's quite flexible, but um, like you say, the gardening manager. You kind of want someone who knows. There, there are job descriptions, um, but it is interesting how that has evolved. Like, I was describing Sonia, who was here this past year with us, as the organizational administrator. When we hired her, we had been looking for um, a different role, so to speak. But with the talent she came with, we, we, we morphed the position and hired her. And it met our needs for the year. At the end of the year, when she was, she was looking to move on, we, we looked at the overall organization and decided we wanted to advertise exactly what she had been doing because she was such, filled such a, 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 a good slice of the pie, a good slice of the workload. So um, we, she was the organizational administrator, but the new position is the organizational fundraiser because she was so fun that that was part of like what she brought to the organization. So person we wanted to bring in, we wanted them to be aware that, yeah, you had to be fun. And, and you know, just sort of that, that element of the organization, because she, she, she did so much of the public face. So, you got to be fun. By the description. Yes? Um, two questions. So, do you only do food production, or do you also do, like, uh, medicinal plants and uh, stuff for crafting? If not, like, how easily do you think you'd be able to integrate that in? That is really solid thinking in terms of more integration for the overall farm system. We would, and, and it fits into dovetails into your question as well, as far as expanding the acres or the possibilities, like we have this herbal apothecary in the ground, we're just waiting for an herbalist to come and to sign up and say, look, wow, you guys got a lot of plant material here I could do something with. Yeah. So, so try, try to connect this organization, this platform, with individuals who have passion. We have a space right now, you know, we have a 10-year-old blacksmith. We've had a blacksmith in residence in the past. It would be good, perhaps, to get another blacksmith. They could, they could you know, form a little apprentice relationship. We have the infrastructure. We have already that umbrella, D Acres Over, where we could we have a website already, we could do internet sales, we, we have retail space. So yeah, you start really looking at all the different ways other people with passion could get involved in the project. Yeah, and let me just like, kind of go over those capabilities that they're working on in South America, where they do that. It's like, you have a business idea, we have this land, come here, come here, and just come here. So. You know, there, there's very powerful things happening in, in the south of the equator in terms of this. And it, it really does, I think, go back to the situation where there's land that's not occupied and people are starving in the cities. People are, are don't have opportunity, don't have independence. So how do we get those people back on the land? Where those resources are, where they can make something from the land? Um, because in, in the cities, in this concrete jungle, it's just not necessarily as much opportunity to, to forge that degree of independence or resilience. Um, also, I just wanted to ask, do you have a gray water system? Can you do it at that scale? Gray water. That's a, um, currently, we are, hmm, there's a compost system, so all the human manure goes that way. And then the gray water system currently for all the water in the main building is just going into the septic. We haven't figured it out. I think we would like to set up something of the nature of like a living machine 
um, something that we could recycle the water and grow um, in that water and you know, use that nutrient with rich water for food production or at least biomass production. But that would be another great one. <laughs> if someone has a particular interest in you know, experimenting with wastewater, we have the site, we have the potential. So let's make that match, let's integrate that, that function. I'm going to get him and then her, and then we only have five minutes left. You guys are getting excited now. I wish you had all day. You guys had to come visit. This is great. So, yes, sir. Uh, just related to that uh, place that I have to make those that I have because I'm going to use for water and the water and the water and the water. I think it would be. Um, gray water in general is a little risky in terms of, you know, it can get septic pretty quick. So, you, you, I'm not sure I would use it for. Um, Vegetable crops that I was going to eat without cooking, or um, I'm not sure I would use it necessarily for surface irrigation. Maybe if it was going to be for a field crop irrigation, I would suck it into like soaker hoses below ground. Um, but definitely, you want to clean clean the crap out of it. In in terms of, it needs aeration and it can't sit for a while, so your system has to be in motion, which is difficult in this climate because once it heads outdoors it wants to freeze. So to get that living machine up and running you need to take it to a, a facility that has enough heat generated so it could be active aerated and also used readily. And how it would be ideally to be used readily would be the up plant roots or uh, tilapia or some such. But two, the tilapia, I don't even know how tilapia, bleh. and then tilapia that had been fed toothpaste fit, like, ugh. like we'll probably use that tilapia to, to um, fertilize the corn, you know, so to speak. Um, I thought somebody was reporting, but yes, ma'am. Um, have you gone further with your thinking around the potential of That's what this is all about. This is, this is it. This is not the crap. This is how how we can transcend and perpetuate it as a race. You know, do we need to leave some of that, some of our needs behind? And, and this, like, what I need is is like confidence or that contract or, you know, it. How is it going to happen? And I don't know yet. I'm going to find out. Um, one way or the other. But uh, we're not there yet. This is the biggest question, and read the Intentional Communities magazine, Community and the Law. 80 to 90 percent of the communities that fail are because of disgruntled people within the community. They turn people in. So we're trying to do a new model within an old model, and that's the nut to be cracked, as you say. What is it called? Yeah, Intentional Communities magazine. Really great resource, ic.org. Yep. Intentionalcommunities.org. A tremendous resource. Definitely the law that was last month, and it's, it's amazing. It's the elephant in the kitchen. Yes, sir. I'm curious to know what notable failures have you learned? My own. <laughs> um, my own personality weaknesses. My own um, trying to trying to, to project this in. in such a way that it comes out as an authority or as a, a dominant presence. I think that's been my greatest lesson is to let my ego go. I mean, I, I think, you know, people would like to refer to me as someone who had the, the vision or whatnot, but I think I was just someone who was in uh, fate, you know, sort of circumstance. And I think I'm reacting to that. I don't necessarily think I do have that kind of vision. What I, what I'm trying to profess is the need to, to, to bring others into that loop. And so I think that over time, somehow that message that I was conveying has gotten confused, you know, be it the perspective of others or being how I was carrying myself, but as more of an authority or more as a, you know, some sort of dictator in this. And I, that's not the way.
And so that's been my biggest lesson for sure. Um, oh gosh, on the ground, you can't plant your edible forest in a forest. It needs full sun. I planted some black walnuts, and I swear they're still this big. You know, they're in the, in the forest somewhere, and they just don't grow. They need full sun. So, yeah, that was a waste of money and time. Um, yeah. Is the board helping with that vision? I mean, is that, or is it still, or do you find it that the board itself is still confused in terms of what the long term vision is? And yeah. I, you know, because you get a board of directors and you end up, you know, you, the first board of directors, usually your friends and family. It's just the nature of it. You don't really trust the situation, you don't know who to ask. So, you, 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 you find somebody like your uncle or somebody has a different last name and he gets on the board and you, know, <laughs> you, you, you stack the board with friends and family. It's typically what people do. Um, then your friends and family, you know, after a couple of years, they get tired of coming to those board meetings and whatnot, you know, and you start transitioning. The next phase you go through, you say, oh, we should recruit professionals. We should get an accountant. We should get a lawyer. We should get a doctor. You know, all these people in different fields that have different skills. So you get your accountant, you get your doctor, and they don't know anything about what you're doing. You know, they're, they're an accountant. So the, right now, we've transitioned to people who have been coming to the farm for a long time, who know the farm, or people who have lived there prior, or have like taken courses, who are, who are pretty astute about permaculture, have, have more knowledge base, and slowly, we are pushing towards this, oh, you guys are the community owners. You understand you're actually my boss. Like, that is taking a long time. It's still, I, I, I met with a board member a couple weeks ago just for the whole purpose of let's go for a walk and talk. You know, three hours of just like, let me, let me spill my guts to you so you know where I'm coming from because he, he's real good. He's a doctor and he's real good at real, real stuff. Me, I'm not so good at that. So it's helpful to have him on the board because I like to talk in terms of, wow, the pie in the sky, this would be great. And he's better at being like, well, the first thing you would need is insurance. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's a good combination, but by the same token, like I need to get, give him a little bit more of where we're coming from. And you know, we have retreats, and the uh, president is you know a guy who who did come. 15 years ago and, and does sort of understand this process and understands, you know, localization and try to bring economic vitality to our area so our youth can feel proud about living here and stay here and, you know, that sort of stuff. So it's it's moving, but it's slow. That's another thing. Patience, biggest mistake. I thought all this would be done in five years. Well, I have five years. We'll have this up and running. This will be great. <laughs> That's in that lifetimes. Maybe not done in mind. Do you have concern that when you're not no longer involved that it might stray from your vision? I think it will. I think it, it will always stray. It's that part of what builds resiliency is evolution. And so it has to evolve, it has to adapt. I that that would be my first mistake that I was referring to, is to say this is the way it has to be. The way it has to be is, is to perpetuate. It has to survive. We have to survive. And so, yeah, if we can claw our way to get there. Well, what you're doing doesn't match the vision of your uncle. It's evolved. <laughs> they, they definitely had a, a family farm vision, and then my parents, when I was growing up, had an art co-op vision. And now we have this collective farm community service vision. So once again, it's sort of been through phases. Because yeah, my aunt and uncle moved up there to get away from the city. They wanted their independence and you know, get away from crime and get away from pollution and all that sort of stuff. My family has changed so much from hundred years ago. We gotta let go that this family owns this farm. Evolution. Yes, sir. We, we have limited time, so that'll question. probably be the last question. Yeah? I'm just curious if your community has any kind of connection to a local church or other spiritual kind of place. Mm, that is a great point. Um, we try to as best we can. Some of more of the traditional churches are a little put off because they're a little hippie, a little rough around the edges. 
the UU, you know, we get along good with the, the UU type folks. Um, but I think that is something that you really have to look at when you come into a community is establishing those that network. You know, be it the Rotary Club, be it the, the small business owners, be it the PTO. But, but do get in there and, and build alliances with other people, especially if you can, to try to make that bridge happen. You know, I, I, I need to, to, to keep extending the olive branch to those more conservative churches and so forth as well. It's definitely a strong point. I think we'll close. Um, welcome to go to our website. We have a website or visit us. And we have an overnight stay in the raffle. So enter the raffle and you come stay for free. And other than that, you guys are free to go. Shoot.